So for this project, we are going to make a piece similar to what I'm showing here. Uh, this comes from Sherline's tip section with the user submitted tips. And this is tip number 28, uh, making a better y-axis lock. That was originally submitted by uh, Larry Mortimer. Now I followed the, the directions and the plan um, laid out in tip number 28. And what I discovered is that it doesn't uh, work with the exact dimensions of my mill. This is probably something I should have checked ahead of time, but this gives me an opportunity to remake the part and make some changes to it. So I'm not going to follow the plans uh, in, anymore. You are welcome to follow the plans and you'll get a part similar to this. The problem that I ran into and why it doesn't work very well on my mill is that this hole was located a little bit too high on the part so that the bottom edge of this would rub against the angle. That was quite easy to fix with a file. I just put a, a small uh, chamfer on that edge and now it clears without any problem. The second issue is this step and shoulder here is specified to be 30 thousandths and on mine the saddle hangs out uh, much further than the base so at only 30 thousandths deep uh, i'm nowhere near to getting the, the contact i need there in order to use this as a clamp now i could mill off some more from this surface but at that point i'm probably going to start to get thinner and thinner on this piece and rather than modify this um, i'm just going to start from scratch i'm going to make it out of a little bit thicker material and i'm also going to put a recess behind it in order to put a spring in there so that i can make sure it doesn't rub or contact and i'm going to make it based on measurements from my mill uh, rather than measurements from the plan drawing the overall purpose of the piece is to provide a y-axis lock to replace the factory y-axis lock. We use the exact same hole and the exact same threads that the factory lock uses, but we've removed the thumb screw and that thumb screw by default presses on a, a tapered nylon plug on the inside of the screw hole, which then presses against our gib and that's supposed to pull the dovetail tight and lock the axis. But we've lubricated these surfaces, so I, I don't believe it's very functional method of, of locking those those down. So I'm going to deviate from the plans and make a couple of changes. In order to do that, I'm starting out with a slightly larger block. So this block I cut off of a inch and a quarter by half inch flat aluminum bar. And off of there I cut a piece approximately three quarters of an inch wide. I'm going to probably end up being about 0.7 inches wide with my face cuts here. Now most of the dimensions on the bar aren't critical. Uh, the length is going to be the one that's going to be important to us. So the bar that I cut this off of started out at one and a quarter inches wide. So I have to cut almost a quarter of an inch off. So I measured down from the top of my saddle down to the base where the angle begins on the base and that was 1.012 which is the lower of these two marks. Now I probably could have put this back in the saw and cut off a fair amount instead of whittling away at it like this. I'm taking off 25 thousandths at a time. The top mark is 1.05 and I'm thinking I may just cut to that and then put a little bit of a chamfer on the piece because I just think that'll look a little bit nicer. So we could use our calipers to check the exact length of this piece or we can just attempt to go to that line or close to the line. Uh, this measurement isn't super critical, so. So rather than attempt to measure to the center of that hole, I'm going to just use a transfer screw to make the measurement and then it acts as a center punch for where that hole is located at. So using a transfer screw I simply put the piece with the top of it pressed against the bottom of the table and gave it a tap with the transfer screw in the hole and I get a mark. Now I don't want to use that exact location 
because then I'd be rubbing against my table. So I used a caliper and the mark was about 0.59 from the top edge and so I just went 0.575 to make it a, a little bit shorter there. Now that gives us one mark. Next we measure the width of our piece and cut that in half. So mine is a little bit under three quarters of an inch at 0.72. So half of that is 0.36, which would be my center line. And I marked a cross point where we'll drill our hole. Then we need one more mark, which is this line here. And this is 0.76 uh, down from the top face. I measured the thickness of my saddle as being approximately uh, three quarters of an inch, so I went another ten thousandths, and this will be where we take our step to, or maybe just beyond that, maybe another ten thousandths or so beyond that. So we'll have to first drill our hole, and then I'm going to put a, a small counter bore in it for a spring as well, and then we'll mill away this face up here, leaving this face protruding so this will engage into our base. So let's start by center punching that hole and drilling it out. So in the previous video I mentioned using a scriber point and that was for our strap clamps which the tolerances weren't really tight on and I suggested the scriber point as you might not have other options. Now the scriber point isn't our best option because the scriber point is going to to possibly be bent and it may also not set true in the drill chuck or you might have some some things out of tolerance a little bit in the drill chuck so we want to take a look at a different way of doing this so the tool that we are going to end up using is what's commonly known as a wiggler so this is a, a shaft with a ball end on it and then a collet that holds the ball and allows it to move around you can tighten the, or loosen this collet and then it's got a 3 8 inch shaft i haven't seen any with a quarter inch shaft they, they may be out there i haven't looked um, but we'll need to use a 3 8 inch drill chuck uh, because of the diameter of the shaft. Okay, so I had to drop the part down into the, into the vise a little bit deeper. It's still setting up on parallels, just a thinner set of parallels. Um, we wouldn't be able to surface it because it's pretty much flush right now. But we will be able to drill a hole in it and we'll raise it back up to surface it. I think I am going to put that uh, column extension back in uh, because some of these devices and tooling I keep on running into limitations on. So the wiggler will, by default, as you see, um, wiggle or wobble around. Now you need to use a tool to to bring it into a center point. Um, you can use a pencil. I like to use these little uh, plastic tipped in gun cleaners, gun picks, uh, just because I have them around for, for cleaning the mill as well. And you can run it at a higher speed. I just did it at a slower speed here. And you just press until it'll run fairly close to center or dead on center. Now if you press too hard, it'll end up going out. So make sure you're using a tool where your uh, finger or hand isn't in there close by. Because the point of this is fairly sharp. So I moved the camera out of the way and I just visually aligned it um, with the crosshairs there. You could actually lower this down into the divot as well and adjust it that way. Um, in this case, we really don't need that level of accuracy and it does wear out the tool a little bit faster. So I didn't bother doing that. We could also locate this using an edge finder, uh, which we'll show an edge finder in another video. I'm trying to keep the, the tools, uh, show you the different options and, and keep the tools simple and progress to more complex as we go. So now I put a number two center drill into the chuck and, and we want to use a center drill for higher accuracy and a number two center drill is 3 16 which is 0.1875 and I'm going to put a little bit of uh, cutting fluid on here as well and the hole that we're going to drill is going to be in be 0.193 so just slightly over the size of the center drill now as I mentioned before I believe in the lathe videos the center drills can be fairly easy to break. So just take your time. Be sure and use plenty of cutting fluid. Back out often to clear the chips. 
And we don't want to go deeper to where we're actually drilling a hole with the diameter of the shaft. We just want to use the chamfer on the shaft to give us a starter hole. Now to drill our actual hole, we're going to use a number 10 bit. This is 0.193 in diameter. The major diameter of our screw is 0 0.190. So this will just be three thousandths over. So it'll be a, a nice snug fit. And there's our completed hole. Now I'm going to put a counter bore in this to fit a spring. This is entirely optional. And if you're not going to do the counter bore in the spring, then you can probably make the block uh, considerably thinner rather than half inch thick, either three eighths or quarter inch thick. Okay, so I went through the springs I had on hand and the only one that I've got is, is pretty heavy and will require a, a 5 16 hole. Um, I do wish I had a, a lighter spring, but uh, I can always replace this with a lighter gauge spring later if it ends up being too stiff. Now this hole, I want to drill to about 3 eighths of an inch. So I'm going to use the markings on my hand wheel to go down probably about 350 thousandths. There's 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300, and 350. Now our counter bore is done. So the, the last major machining operation we have to do is to remove the majority of this face down to a particular depth. The plans call for 30 thousandths. Um, I measured and on mine the offset is 45 and I went a little bit more than that for, for clamping. So I'm going to take this down to 55 thousandths. I'm just going to bring the cutter down until it touches and we can leave a fine scratch on the surface and set zero on my hand wheel. Make sure our cutter can clear and I'm going to start with a 20 thousandths depth of cut. Now I've, I've, I'm not using the standard Sherline end mill. So this is the, the standard mill that comes with the kit. It's um, a high speed steel double ended two flute three eighths inch cutter. I've replaced that with a, a little bit of a higher end cutter. It's still a two flute. It's single ended. Um, I prefer the single ended mills with the mill holders uh, just because we only have one sharp end to deal with. They're easier to store because we can just set the mill holder on its base. And this happens to be solid carbide, so it's going to last us quite a while. Additionally, this is, is coated. So this is coated with ALTIN. That's aluminum titanium nitride. The AL doesn't mean it's designed specifically for aluminum. That's just part of the chemistry and the coating. And the coating uh, requires very little lubrication to, to cut well. And it works well with a variety of materials. Long term, I'm going to end up using a minimal lubrication system. So this type of tooling is going to work perfect for that. Now I can run higher speed since we are running solid carbide. And we're going to begin with a conventional cut set to 15 thousandths, or sorry, 20 thousandths. Now this is a climb cut, but since we're not taking a very heavy cut, I'm comfortable with the climb cut in this case. If you want to do conventional cuts uh, in one direction, uh, you're certainly welcome to do that. Now we could use that carbide insert fly cutter on this type of an operation and, and probably do it in a single pass. Because that carbide insert fly cutter has a square shoulder on it like an end mill. But I'm just going to use this conventional two flute mill. And I'm taking another 20 thousandths. So when I went ahead and cut up to the line on this pass, and we're at 40 thousandths. Now I'm actually going to set my depth of cut. 
So I've set for a 15 thousandths and I'm cutting to that line. So this would be 55 thousandths, which is what I mentioned as our depth. But down here on the bottom, I'm actually going to go 60. Just to give us a little bit of extra clearance. But the top side, I do want to keep at 55. So I'm going to raise my cutter up and then bring it back down to where I will be at 50 thousandths. I'm going to take a couple passes there. And the reason we raise up and then come back to the measurement is in case there's any backlash in our axis. And then we're going to take our last five thousandths cut as our finishing pass. So I was going to take this down with a hand file, but um, might as well just do it in the mill since we're already here. I just set it at a rough 45 degree angle. I didn't actually measure anything. And then the exact dimension doesn't matter on this. I just want to take that edge off. Okay, so before we do a test bed, I'm going to deburr uh, this hole just so we don't end up scratching anything on both sides and do a quick deburr of the piece. Um, I'll do a final deburr once I make sure everything's going to work well. For deburring on holes, the easiest tool to use is a chamfering tool like this. It's just a hand-driven tool. Um, if you don't have one of these, then you can just use a drill bit. Uh, this is just has a handle on it and, and is a uh, nice, quite sharp writing. You know, it's 45 degree angle, so. So here are our two work pieces side by side. The one on the right was built to the dimensions laid out in the Sherline Tip 28, and it didn't work very well. On my particular machine, the step wasn't deep enough, and I could have, have milled this shallower, but I thought might as well start, start over, uh, do it right. So now we've got a step that's deep enough, which is 55 thousandths from this surface. And we move the hole down a little bit, so that we're able to get a little bit of a wider clamping surface here. Whereas this was just sitting too low on my machine. Again, maybe Sherline uh, changed the location of where that, that built-in screw is at. And then I made it thicker in order to put a counter bore to put a spring into. So I've got that spring in place here and that will keep tension uh, to where the piece won't rub and won't rattle. Um, when it's not locking. I have test fit it. It locks very, very good. I'm very happy with the, the performance of it. Um, I may do a little bit of just dress up work on it as far as uh, milling some chamfers in the back since it is a little bit of a heavier piece or some chamfers down these long corners. But for now it is a functional piece and ready to be utilized.